ZP, yeah. how you doing, man? Dude, I'm great. Look at this. Good. Look what we got here. <laughs> we we got a setup, don't we? This feels uh, this feels right. Yeah, definitely. It's exciting. Doing um, it right here. Before we get going, let's get you some coffee. I'm please got blacksmith roastery from Selena, Kansas. Um, buddy of mine Dude. has a place out there. Brought back a T-shirt, so I felt like I should support the place, and it is delicious. This is the espresso especial. So I love this. There you go. Dude, Kansas reminds me of uh, Jayhawk League. Yeah, there you go. Summers out there playing. Cheers. I don't know. Yeah. It's all jacked up and talk. Yeah, right. I love it. So, uh, you know, in, in kind of looking at things, I've got to tell you, man, you might have, you may be the only guy that had a worse experience in the Taiwan baseball league than I did. Yeah. What What happened out there? Um. It. You know. It was, uh, I was really excited to get to Taiwan. Um, I, I was at that point in my career where I was still effective, but I never felt right. You know, like I was still, I wasn't yeah. completely injured, but like wasn't all there, but I really wanted to see the world a little bit. So I was excited to get there. And then I, I was sort of, I needed a regimen a very specific regimen for me to be able to perform the way I needed. So I needed to pitch and then have a chiropractor and then get my work in. And I could not find a chiropractor out there, man. And I searched high and low and I did these sessions where these uh, Taiwanese ladies would like walk on my back and, and do all these amazing, I mean, they were great, but I, I needed this particular, you know, I needed this guy to pop my shoulder into place yeah. and I just couldn't find somebody to do it and I couldn't do it myself. And so after my first start there, I knew that like, this is going to be ugly because yeah. it was going to get progressively worse to the point where, um, it was weird because I still had all my velocity, but like when my shoulder would get like that, I had zero touch on the ball, yep. zero feel. So by the end, you know, the radar gun was still, you know, 90 to 92 and kilometers whatever that was i can't remember anymore yeah, 146 or something so, like whatever that. whatever yeah. it was that people were excited about but i promise you dude i couldn't hit this van from 60 feet away and, and it dude that's hard yeah i mean there's one thing about being injured and not having your stuff and there feel it feels like you have a sense of structure in the world you're like i can't do this because of this but when like your velocity's there and there's no pain, but like that is your job as a pitcher, right? Yep. Is to if you simplified it down to the bare minimum, your job as a pitcher is to throw the ball where you want. Mm -hmm. And when you can't do that, it just it makes you question yourself as a human being, much less <laughs> a pitcher. You know what I mean? So it's so painful. It's um, so painful. I mean, you go back to like you're a five year old kid. You're starting baseball. You, you have these like grand ambitions. You never think to yourself, oh, I'm going to be in Taiwan not being able to throw strikes or get anybody out. Like, Dude, it's, it's just it, the simplest form of what you're supposed to do. You, you can't, you know, and just the stress and anxiety of playing catch. Yeah. Brutal, man. Brutal, brutal. I'm talking about feeling. like, you know, say three o'clock stretch. I'm out there at two o'clock before everybody gets out there, maybe in the cage, trying to throw, warm up to a spot. Just, just to be like, okay, I can get it in this vicinity, man. And it's, you look back and it, it's, it's sort of funny, but like, I, I can have, I mean, it's not PTSD, but I can, if I think about it too hard, I'll get stressed out. Yeah, like, I can sure. feel my body like short breaths and stuff because it's like, at the end of the day, it's, it's the most, the basic, it's like not being able to hold a bat. Yeah. It's like, oh, you can't hit a bomb. No, I, I can't even hold a bat. And it's, um, so Needless to say, I I was very torn, man, because I didn't want to leave Taiwan because I really wanted to experience it, but at the same time, I wanted to get the hell out of there. Yeah, like it, it was this weird duality of of wanting to be there, but just knowing that this thing wasn't going to get better. And I think, man, my last last start I had with those guys, it was packed house playing the elephants. Yeah, and just again like praying that a guy would hit a home run off of me because it meant that I threw the ball in a vicinity of a strike so um 
But, you know, it was that, that flight home from Taiwan was the first time I was like, all right, bud, what's up next? You know, I always had these grand ambitions of like after baseball doing something completely different and, and trying to reinvent myself in a way. But when you're actually faced with that reality, it's like, oh, yeah, it's you, scary. you're not prepared for this. For sure. And, you know, as you know, that's a long, it's a long flight home to be in your own head. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's almost it's almost nice because you get to totally you get to digest what just happened and hopefully you get to eject it out of your body. But I mean, like you said, I think the biggest thing, you know, with baseball, when I look back is, is, yeah, you have those moments where you're like, oh, my God, I remember that feeling and how it can totally lock you up as a human being. And it, and this has nothing to do with like baseball, baseball. It's just living your life. You you immediately go back to that spot mentally where you're like, oh, my gosh, this is just – it can be the worst. And you're right. That's a great way to put it. It's You just – you feel locked up. Like everything tightens and, and you sort of freeze a little bit. But it's amazing that in those situations we still, like, will put ourselves out there to compete, man. Yeah. Like the idea, thinking of that idea that – I mean, even right now, like, if you were like, hey, we need to pitch game seven of the World Series – and it starts in 10 minutes, I'd be like, let's go. Yeah. You know, but that reality of being a, you know, I remember even before Taiwan, just being in Tulsa one time and um, coming out of relief when I was rehabbing and I don't know, nine balls in a row or something. And then you throw a strike and like 8,000 people cheer. <laughs> like you just Sarcastically. A, yeah, <laughs> like you just threw a no hitter. And you, you just, you're so in your head because you're like, mad at them you're like you're cussing them in your head yeah uh yeah man it's um but it's one of those things i guess like i look back and it's like go i mean going through that like they're in real life i haven't been across very many situations where i was as like nervous as going into a a game knowing i absolutely knowing this was not going to go well yeah and still doing it i know I think it, it prepares you to kind of deal with um, damage control, I, I guess, or at least being able to fake it in a, in a way that, um, I don't know, man. It, it's, uh, well, tell me about your, what, like, what happened with you in, in Taiwan? So I stunk, like plain and simple. And this was getting to the point where you, know, you, you have your career arc and you feel like it's going really well. And, you know, at this point I'd gone past the climax. I was on the down part. <laughs> And so I get there, stuff isn't great. You know, I never threw very hard, but, you know, at some points I would be 86, 88, you know, maybe a little bit more, a little bit more when I was younger too. But at that point, you know, when I was going good, I was, I was 85, 88, you know, soft lefty, good breaking ball. Get to Taiwan. I don't have that. I'm 83, 84, maybe 85 on my best day. And this was a little different back then. It's not like it is now where everybody throws 95, but still that is below average velocity. So I get out there, get three weeks of acclimation time. I'm throwing bullpens. I mean, you could tell immediately they're like, all right, this isn't what we were hoping for. And, you know, everybody's starting to gather around bullpens when I'm throwing every few days. And and finally, I have a decent one towards the end. So they decide, okay, this guy's ready for an outing. So get out there, playing, again, packed house. And, I mean, it was just not, not pretty. Four innings, I think, five runs. I did find out later that the catcher, was arrested for point shaving, my catcher. So he was potentially telling everybody what was coming, and you know, got you know, got thrown in jail. It was a, it was a big deal. If you look at the Taiwan history of the base, you know, baseball wise, it's it's got a checkered past yeah, with that they stuff. They don't mess around. No, there's a lot of a lot of gambling and, and little things. But the point is, I didn't pitch very well. Um, get on, get on the bus back home from Kaohsiung and literally don't take a step off the bus before the guy says, President called, you are being sent home. Then they decide that they don't want to pay me all the money. So it got ugly a little bit, but thankfully everything worked out, got home. But long story short, I was not good. But yeah. I was I was heartened to see that maybe somebody else didn't have a great experience as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw your uh, I saw your experience and said, uh, hold my beer. Yeah, exactly. Hold my, uh, hold my Chinese wine. Yeah. Um, so at what point did you, uh, did you think maybe a change was coming? I, I, I mean, I knew it was 
like like they don't they don't have great poker faces over there, you know. Yeah. So, like you said, all of a sudden, the the manager will you know because your your whole your interactions with everybody is through your interpreter. So, when the manager stops walking by and like looked like he was actively avoiding like going out of his way to avoid running into me. And I mean, I, I couldn't blame them. Like they bring, you know, the one thing that's different about overseas is they don't have a, they have a limit on foreigners. Mm-hmm. So these are pretty coveted spots. Like you need to be, you know, three or four foreigners. So you need to be doing really well. And, and I knew it was coming and, um, I just, I wanted, I wish they would have handled it better, but, but I mean, I'm sure you felt the same way because it's, I, I don't need the manager to like give me his blessing, but when it's just like, the the scrawny interpreter that you've kind of like been picking on and having fun with is like, uh, you're going home. You must go now. You must go now. And like all of a sudden he's not your buddy anymore. Yeah. Like, and I mean, I'm sure that's a hard spot for those guys. Yeah, for sure. Because they do, you know, you develop a relationship with them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, and to be honest, man, I think I was ready. I think I was I, I was just ready for a change because I felt like even at my best, I was, I was working so hard and doing so much extra to be like a version of myself that it wasn't fun. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. even though the velocity was there, it was like, I wasn't competing like I wanted. Mm-hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't saying two seamer away, I'm going to break this guy's bat and I'm going to come, or I'm going to come back with a cutter in. It was up there just like, mm. please throw a strike. Yeah. I know, I know the feeling. And it is it, like, like you said, it's helpless. Fun, man. Yeah, helpless. And and it makes you, it makes you long for those days where like, even when you weren't playing your best in the minor leagues, you still sort of, you were more of like a, a, playing a video game. Yeah. Where like you could sit there and like you just had the confidence to be like, even if you missed a spot, you're like, well, I'm not going to miss it again or, or whatever. But when when you're just out there and it's, it's sort of like a, a very like prehistoric version of baseball where it's like throw ball, hit ball. Like yeah. that, that was no fun, man. Yeah. And I was having to do so much extra just to get to that point. Um, but you know, and I, I just think I was ready for a change. So, you know, getting back from Taiwan and really giving it the thought of what I wanted to do next. Um, I, I just think I was ready for that in my life. So, so at what point was it on the flight? At what point did you realize baseball's done? I'm moving on. And where am I going? Yeah, it was baseball. I mean, even now, I still have, like, baseball's not done. I think there'll always be, like, this <laughs> tiny shimmering light in the back of my head that's, like, you know, and, and, and it's, I, I, I bet everybody feels that. Yeah. Like, you have to, right? Yeah, There's I was getting ready to go it. to Germany this summer, possibly. I know the feeling, yeah. So it's, it's, it's so it was like, I'm going to take a pause on baseball. And it, it happened to be, um, I came back, I got back, like, at June, and I was like, I don't want to rehab this summer. This is perfect. I'll take the summer off, figure out what I want to do, enroll in school in the fall, because uh, I came out of a junior college, so I still had a couple years left to get, which I, I was excited to do. And then next summer, we'll see where we're at. And um, so it was sort of like put it on the back burner. Uh, but then I, in the course of a couple of weeks being back home, I kind of figured out what I wanted to do next. And that really sort of put it on like the double back burner because I, all of a sudden I was super excited about this new thing, um, you know, making movies and stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I dove headfirst in that and went to school. And then it actually came around that next summer where an Atlantic League team that I pitched really well for a bunch hit me up and they wanted me to come. And I said I would, I would come, but I had to finish school and like I wanted to pr- prioritize that semester. So I actually did go and play for like another month that next year, um, and I actually felt great. Yeah, taking all that time off was fantastic. But you know, I missed spring training, and like I was prepping, and you know I was prepping for it, but I wasn't. And then when I actually got in game action, you know, like two starts in, pulled like a, my hammy or whatever, just something. And, and again, I told him I was like, look, I'm not. I don't want to spend the summer. Uh, on the DL, so if you just let me pitch through this, if I if I suck, let me go, and if I can handle it, then I'll stay. Yeah. And I, I couldn't couldn't <laughs> handle it. The old uh, 
the old plant leg pulled hammy does, yeah, not, does not bode work. well for a, a pitcher. So. No, it does not. So I, I left and, you know, uh, came back and then took a summer class. And again, it was, I, I felt great. And it was sort of a thing where like, well, I'll pick this up again. And then it's like, you know, here we are 10 years later. Yeah. Um, but man, I, there's, I don't know what it is. It's just, there's a part of me that some days where it's like, like if I could do anything, it's not even about getting to the big leagues, but if I could, if I could go play in Mexico again or, um, some place where I was getting to like explore and travel, like, dude, I would, of course I would do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, there's always that flicker. Like I'll be 80 years old and I'll be like, give me two weeks. Can I throw a cutter? Yeah. Yeah. Give, give me two weeks. Is there a chiropractor in the house? <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. But yeah, but it was, you know, one of my biggest concerns with finishing baseball was like, does that do those juices? Does that competitive instinct uh, does that go away? And I was just really excited that when I found the next thing, that it was like, oh no, it, it just immediately transitioned to yeah. that. So it was that idea of living and breathing baseball, like I immediately turned that into something else, which uh, was exciting. You know, you baseball was the focus as long as I can remember. So for, for me to be able to kind of uh, parlay that into something else, and it was, uh, it, was, it was an exciting time, to be honest with you. I, yeah, I had cool. a lot of fun going back to school. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. And I think one of the things that I'm always curious about, because I've stayed in the game. I'm, you know, coach right now, and it's been that thing, once it gets its teeth in you, it's pretty pretty tough to let go. And, and I'm always envious of those that can step out and say, I'm, I'm doing something totally different. So did you feel like your skills or maybe the, you know, the attributes you developed through baseball translated to the real world? Because, you know, I don't know. I'm still I'm a baseball yeah. coach. Um, I, the first, at first I, I, they did not. And I was extremely concerned because just trying to get back into school at UT, it was like, write up a resume. And it was like, oh no, <laughs> I've wasted 10 years. Like what? what do you put? You put like Atlantic league all-star or, <laughs> you know, pitched in Taiwan. Like yeah. I would get, you know, I would get in front of people and they would see that. And it was a great conversation starter. Everybody loved talking about it, but it's not like you don't want, you want to have a beer with that guy. You don't want to hire that guy. Yeah. Or, or, um, so that was interesting at the beginning, but then once I actually started working, and getting into real situations, it immediately, you know, it's like, it's like we were saying, it's when you're faced with adversity in the real world, um, being able to handle it in a way that a professional athlete can handle it is yeah. head and shoulders above, um, I think what most people, you know, it's just the stress of being booed by thousands of people or, or being out there on the, you know, the loneliest place in the world on the mound when, you know that the ball's not going to go where it needs to go or um, that that hardens you in a positive way you know it's I, I don't wish it on people but it I think it, it benefits you and I saw that immediately when I got into like the real working environments whether it was like on set something went wrong everybody's panicking and then you can kind of like stay calm and just direct everybody and be like look Trust me, this is not bad. Like I've, I've seen bad. I've been bad. I've been in Mexico when they were throwing limes at me as they were taking me out of the mound in the first inning. So, um, yeah, I, I think it, it absolutely does. And, and I think you'll when you get into the real world, people understand that. So, like the first couple jobs I got, I had that horrible resume, but people understood that. Like, okay, I'm not. I'm I'm hiring him because of these things. Like the fact that he played this long and dealt with this much adversity, like I trust putting a guy like that into um a situation as opposed to somebody who might have done it before but at sort of a low low stress level maybe. Yeah. You know, my transition was so night and day. Yeah. From sports to film and uh tackling that world. So it was it was sort of easy for me to forget baseball for a while. Uh, almost totally, but like for you going from a player to a coach, uh, like what was that like? Like how what's what's transition like when you're not leaving the game but you are leaving the you know that 
the aspect that we've talked about about yeah. getting the the yeah. call and all that. So it's been interesting because I feel like I never felt like I would be a coach when I was done. I'd always think I was always thinking to myself, oh, I'm going to do something totally different. Um, I don't want to be a baseball lifer, and here I am at 40 years old, and I'm totally a lifer. I don't see myself ever fully quitting it, so to speak. It's like that, you know, it, it, once it gets it hook, its hooks in you, it's, it's there and, and it's so tough to get out. So, um, for me, it, yeah, I, I referenced it a little bit earlier, but you know, it was an opportunity to, to kind of stay in the game. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I thought I would have some, some grand ambitions when I was done, but I didn't. And so I got offered, you know, to coach a club team. And then, you know, it was kind of an easy transition because it was a little bit of money and, you know, as minor leaguers, we're used to a little bit of money, so it worked out perfect. And um, then it moved into high school, and then here we are five years into Miracoast High School in Manhattan Beach, Los Angeles area, um, and it's been awesome. I love it. Uh, I go back to the biggest reason I'm doing it is is what I mentioned earlier, is just needing – there are like five or six times in my career if somebody would have just said, hey, dude, you're going to be fine if you can just do X, Y, and Z. And not X, Y, and Z is if you can get a better balance point or things like that. But if you can just, you know, just relax and get back to what makes you good, you know, have confidence, you know, kind of like Zinter reference, you know, kind of re-fall in love with yourself and what got you to this point. And so I felt like, you know, I, I would have loved that in my career. If somebody that I trusted that had had the experience could tell me that. And so I felt it was... It was a good fit. Um, I really appreciate the mentor side. I mean, I think ultimately that's our job as coaches now is, you know, helping helping young guys through a transitional time in their life and helping them move in a direction with, with real tools to have success. So, you know, long story short, that's kind of what it was. It was a feeling of, you know, I kind of fell into it, but now I'm I'm happy I'm here. Did you – was it, was it a struggle though? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you get to – we were five years old and all you think about is playing in the big leagues. And, you know, there are many a days where to this day, I, you know, just think, man, I didn't play in the big leagues. That, that sucks. Like that's, you know, 11 years of minor leagues, you know, jumped around all over the place, got to triple a felt like there were a couple of times and not necessarily close, but you know, like the momentum was moving my direction and, and you look back and that's it. And like, you know, we all have our grand ambitions of, you know, one day we're going to do this and we're going to play 10 years in the big leagues. And, and after that, life is simple. And But it's just not the case sometimes. Life is not simple. No, it is not. Um, well, tell me, like, what what tools did you have in your toolkit to deal with that transition? I mean, did, what were you – did you ever get depressed or, or like um, – You know, it's, it's interesting. You always kind of wonder what your second act is going to be. And if it's – you know, it's, it's never as grand as a baseball player. Like, that's the one thing I I would, you know, when I played, I was a baseball player, like around town, and that was that was cool. Like, I could introduce myself to women as a baseball player, you know, when I'd go to whatever I was doing, and, oh, what do you do for work? Oh, I'm a professional baseball player. It was immediately like a showstopper where people were excited about it. Um, that It's been tough not being a baseball player sometimes. Like, even on the uh, the occupation thing, when you fill out different things, a couple of years after, I would still write professional baseball player, kind of instinctively, but also like I still wanted to be a professional baseball player. So um, I tried to jump out and do different things. I got into yoga, uh, got really into it for a year, got certified, you know, thought I would maybe go that direction. And it turned out, no, it was just, you know, kind of a rebound type situation. Yeah. Um, and then kind of, kind of got into the game, you know, kind of stayed in the game on the coaching side. But but I always go back to like, yeah, it's never quite the same without without being a player and, and all that comes with that. And and it wasn't about like I think midway through it became about trying to be great and not just make it to the big leagues, but like be the best version of yourself. Um, but, you know, ultimately that carrot is still there and you want you want it to happen. So when it doesn't, it's tough. Yeah, for sure. And I you know, it makes me go back to what you were saying about Zenter and um this idea that fall in love with yourself. But I think, and I'm not sure what he meant by it, but I think it's probably important to make the distinction that you need to fall in love with Keith Ramsey or Zach Parker, not 
Zach Parker, the baseball player. Yeah. Because if, if everything's all wrapped up and you being the baseball player, then you strip that away. Who are you? Yeah. It's like making sure you fall in love with that person who doesn't matter if you're playing pool at the bar or dinner with your family that like it's that person because if it's too wrapped up in the baseball thing then then I think that's when it when the toll yeah it really takes south. its toll when yeah. it's when it's over and so I think that's the biggest reason for this podcast is I feel like you know we all as ex-athletes and in different you know different occupations out there when you have a goal or you have a dream you've been doing something your whole life and it it doesn't work out you know we all there's a there's a downtime and what does the transition look like and how do we you know what tools do we have what worked what didn't work um and 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 how do we kind of overcome that and i think that's what's that was kind of the goal with all this is like have conversations real conversations with people that have gone through it you know what worked what was effective um and and how did they how did they kind of get through it all how did they they chop it down and 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 make it all work for their life and and that was kind of the thought yeah i think you know personally i sort of went through this weird like where i had like phantom pains like you you hear about people that like lose a limb and they get like achy achy legs but they don't have a leg or whatever Mm -hmm. my transition from baseball to the next thing was so quick and i jumped in so whole and complete that it was maybe four or five years later when things kind of settled down and I felt semi comfortable at what I was the new thing that I sort of I had like a you know a delayed mourning for baseball like I'd yeah. never really put that away and because I always had that that thing in the back of my head where it's like well worst case scenario I'll go back to baseball <laughs> e- even if it's as much as like making a thousand bucks it's something that I knew that would bring me joy. And you somehow delude yourself into thinking, you know, there's just enough stories out there of people coming back <laughs> after an extended period to make you think that, like, oh, I can do it. Yeah, for sure. Um, you watch The Rookie and you're like, oh, maybe I'll just wake up one day throwing yeah, 95. Here we go. For sure. So, um, yeah, and I think mine sort of hit me a little unexpected because I'd kind of been away from the game for so long. But then all of a sudden it was like, dude, that that's over and you didn't you didn't properly say goodbye yeah um and and luckily i was still doing something i was excited about but it you know it's um watching you know just watching the big leagues and and players you played with and and against and and just especially with the new technologies man like it it made me want to really like man i I would have loved to yeah i've tried that that looks cool i agree so so did you watch do you watch the big leagues when you're done? Uh, no. For for maybe a solid four or five years, I paid attention from a distance, and I would watch uh, Kershaw pitch. Yeah. I, I could never get away from watching it. Because especially at that time, that was when he was like, you know, I would sometimes I would watch until he gave up a hit, and I'd be like, well, I'm good. Because every game you thought he was going to throw a no-hitter. Yeah. Um, but, but overall, I – it felt like a waste. Like I felt like I was, I was trying so hard to learn something new that the idea of three hours every day or every couple of days watching a game in season was like, I'm waste. you know, I'm wasting 20 hours a week. I can't be doing this. And at the same time, it was still rough. You know, I remember when I was still an active player, I got released by the, and I'm going to mess up these dates, but I think the Rockies released me in 07 and that off season, I think oh seven oh eight was when they like went to the World Series. Yeah, and like I, that I was my right, yeah. 07, I think it was. That was my team. Yeah, you know all those guys, and I was super happy for them. But I remember watching one of those games at home and with my mom, and I look over and she's crying, and I'm like, "What?" And she's like, "You know, it was supposed to be you. Like you were supposed to be there." And the thing I didn't need to hear that at the moment, <laughs> I know, you know. Right. Like don't don't tell me what's obvious, um, but but I mean, and I was super supportive. Again, like I never allowed myself to be like the bitter, jaded dude. Like yeah, I have issues true. with things that you know. There were things I wish I'd have done different, and and scenarios that I don't think were handled the best way by all parties involved. But like, 
I didn't want to be Uncle Rico. You know, I didn't want to be like, I could have been somebody, but coach didn't, you know, whatever. Um, but, but I did, I did kind of go all in on, on film. And then it was, you know, it was a solid five years that I was like, you know what, I, I miss, like, I want to be able to watch baseball again guilt free. Like, yeah. I want to be able to kind of uh, enjoy it again. And it was, it just happened to be probably the five years I stopped watching were the five years where the game has evolved the most yeah. in the history of the game. So I remember that first season, I was just kind of clueless, like the new stats and stuff they were paying attention to and launch angle. And, and I was, I, you know, why is everybody striking out? Why is everybody <laughs> cool with all these strikeouts? And I, you know, I had to kind of like relearn a little bit about um, just the way the game's evolving. And I don't love it all, but I, I, I think it's exciting to, yeah. uh, to see how far we're coming so quickly. It's, it's, yeah, it's no, it's, it is absolutely a different game than when we were playing. And like you, you mentioned earlier, it's the, it's the, hey, do it this way because, and now it's, here's why, and we got 50 different metrics to show you, and we have a camera angle, and we have, we have every, every little thing for player development we could ever want. So, no, it's changed a lot, and I think, you know, that, that has, that's helped me a lot, too, and that it feels like I'm relearning a new game in a lot of ways. And, I, and again, I don't love it either. I don't love everything. Um, but... You know, it's it's made it interesting again because, like you said, you get so you you have your own baggage with your own career and jaded, so you don't even want to watch it. And and I got to that point as well. And you know, thankfully recently, yeah, you know, I'm a LA guy, and the Dodgers have been pretty good, so it's been fun to watch them on a day to day basis. That's kind of helped with it. But you know, but like you said, I mean, there's a solid three or four years where it's like baseball. No, thank you. I don't even want to look at all these guys I used to play with yeah, making 10 million bucks and, and cruising. Sure. And I'm uh, hoping for 1500 from a club team this month. Yeah, it's um, for sure. And I mean, I think what's interesting too is, is the industry side of baseball right now with all these changes is it's really democratized, not only being a play, I mean, maybe not being a player, but like the idea, if I was an, if I was a professional coach who's been coaching for 20 years, I'd be terrified because it's not about, you know, your who you know. It's like these guys that can analyze data now are coach like they've never played, but they can interpolate all of that data that's coming through every day, and they have a way of, uh, you know, just it, it. It's really making a lot of these coaches that were essentially just useless, yeah, like prove that they deserve a job, and I think that's incredibly interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. That to, was- not the case. I feel like the people you surround yourself with, I, I hope you, you can hold them to a higher standard because they've had to justify why they're, you know, you see all these big league teams making all these hires and they're all data scientists or, or fans of the game, but, you know, they never played. And when you're playing, like, man, I, I couldn't care less. If you can help me, yeah, I, I don't, man, woman, child, I don't, I don't <laughs> care. Just tell me what. You know, give, give me some advice that I can I can filter through and will help me. I, like, whether you play, you know, Rick Matthews was probably my favorite pitching coach. He was our rover with the Rockies, and he never played. But he he just had a way, he had this zen ability to kind of just all of, he could find the signal and the noise. Yeah. You'd be like, I'm feeling this, 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 this on the mound, and it, this isn't, and he would be like, okay, you know, stay back on your back leg and push off with your this toe. And it was a, probably all horse shit, but it was a way of like taking all of your angst and just channeling into one little spot and letting sort of your natural ability take over. Like I guarantee he probably told people little hints and advice and walked away and they were like, how did you know to tell him that? And he's like, hell if I know. <laughs> just trying to get him out of his own head. Yeah, exactly. And that was and, That's you know, brilliant. And he was a big league pitching coach, bullpen coach for years. Yeah. And and doesn't matter, you know, because really, if you're a head case in a ball, you're probably gonna be a head case in the big leagues. Your stuff just got you there, right? So it's you know we're all dealing with it, man. Yeah. It's, it, and it, like you like, life's not simple. No. Ten years in the big leagues, life is still complex. So. Yep. No, and and I go back to like, you know, you you have this anticipation that you know if you get there, it solves all, and and obviously it's not the case, and so. You know, kind of ask you, jumping back to the movie side, you know, you have this this big league moment where you feel like you want to play in the big leagues, 
baseball wise, but you actually have the big league moment for Thunder Road when you when you win South by Southwest at Austin. I mean, did that has that changed your life? Is it is it any different? Yeah, I mean, it, it's. But to be honest, it, it goes back to the same. I mean, you said something early on in the conversation that I wanted to address, but I sort of got lost in it. But you mentioned we all have this, we all have a career path for ourselves. And to me, that is just setting the expectations to what your career is going to be is no good's going to come from that. And I think with the movie, it was, we had this great success, but truly, man, there were no expectations. And so I think that made success um, more enjoyable, but it was, it was, Honestly, it was just like every other experience I've ever had in my life where I got something I wanted, and as soon as I got it, I was ready for the next thing. Yeah. I remember being, for whatever reason, when I got into pro ball, and my mindset was like, I gotta get to double A. Gotta get to double A. And I, you know, that was like my internet password for a while was like double A, you know, just because yeah. for whatever reason, that was like the goal that I felt was like the most achievable. And I remember making that double-A roster in spring training, reading it on the list at the clubhouse. And by the end of that day, it was like, how do I get to triple-A? Like, how do I get out of here? And it was like, you know, setting yourself up for that expectation that like, man, if as soon as I make my movie, if it wins an award, like, that's going to be it, man. Yeah. Like, that's going to that, – just give me this and then I'll be happy. And then you get it and we won and it was unexpected and we were so happy – went to the after party and but literally it was like at the after party we were talking about like what's the like what's the next movie what's the next project like it, it truly is about learning to enjoy the process because those those little moments of you know getting the call up or pitch winning the big game or, or whatever like those are so fleeting yeah like 99.9% of all of it is the process. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're not enjoying that, then you're completely going to feel unfulfilled. So I think by the time we won, I've had so many of those expectations in my life where, okay, this, I got what I wanted, but I don't feel whole. Like I, I've, I think I've figured myself out that I'm, I'm at my best when I have a goal in front of me and but I also know that, like, no matter how hard I work to get that goal, as soon as I get that goal, I have to pivot to the next thing mm -hmm. because I just know that it's going to be fleeting. And I think that's that way for everybody, you know, like, is man, if I could get that new car, get that new house. But then a week later, you're sitting in that car <laughs> and you're like eating uh, fast food. And it's like it, it just turns into the thing. Right. Yeah. It's, it's about. You know, and, and to be honest, the the place I feel most lost in my life always is when I don't have a goal. It's not when I'm at the bottom trying to get that goal. It's when I'm sort of aimlessly looking about what's the next thing. And that's when I get in trouble mentally because I, I need I need those I need those horizons to be mm -hmm. able to look out at. No matter how far away they are, I feel like if I set my mind to something, I can achieve it. But it's like there'll be random times where like, I'm not sure what the next move is. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, 2020 has been a huge, like, I, I think it's shown that to a lot of people. Like I've had ups and downs this year where it's like the outside world is dictating much more than usual, what your goals can be. Like, I want to travel the world. Well, now <laughs> what else? Yeah, exactly. Like I want, you know, I, I want to, become partner in my law firm. Well, you know, it's going to be tough for a while because, you know, so yeah, I think Agreed. it's, it's just about, you know, for me personally, it's about finding, it's about getting it within a process. I think I've learned to enjoy the process, but now, now I find my issue is like, which process do I want to undertake? Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, but to an long winded to answer your question, like the movie was, I mean, that was such a great, uh, journey and, and, ultimately getting to, to win in my hometown at my like favorite festival and getting to see the world. Like it was incredible, but it, it definitely wasn't, it was a stepping stone. It was, um, more than anything, it was, it was reinforcing that like 
I should follow my gut more. Yeah. Because almost everyone in my life was like, don't quit a job to go make a movie. That doesn't make sense. And then the people that we were trying to get on board with the movie, so many of us were telling us we were doing it the wrong way. Like, it's not going to work. This, you know, it, just the structure of the movie, doing it. But, and uh, Jim and I just truly, uh, the writer, director, actor, Jim Cummings, we truly just stuck to our guns and made sort of a pact that, like, no matter what happened, we were going to make it this way and we were going to be happy with that. Even if it's just something that, like, once a year we get together and watch it in our living room together and nobody else has ever seen it. If we're cool, like if we can promise each other that that outcome we're cool with, then we're bulletproof. Yep. And we were like, we were able to get through everything because our expectations were so low. They weren't low, but the, the, the goal was to enter, to tell that story for ourselves. The goal was the process in essence. Exactly. And so, and I think ultimately that's what made it good. And I think that's what, you know, we made something that we thought we would respond to, that we wanted to see. And the world's huge, man. Like, yeah. no matter what you're into at all, there's somebody else out there like you, you yeah, know? Agreed. And I think the whole world, you know, advertise everything is, is kind of getting into these niche markets. And like with a podcast, like if you wanted to start a podcast about um, peanut butter and jelly and different ways of making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Like, there's a market for that. There's <laughs> you, there's 2,000 people out there that would listen to it. And, I'm sure, yeah. I'm, and, I'm always on how-to on Google. Yeah. So, how, how to make this, how to do that. Yeah, so no, for, yeah, for sure. You know, for us to be able to make something that was so specifically made for the small group of us who made it and to have that resonate, um, I think that's just extremely uh, valuable. Yeah, and I think you, you kind of hit it on the head. The expectations things, you know, might... My wife always wears me out because I'll be, you know, thinking my team is going to have a great year, my college football team or my, you know, my basketball team. And she'll look at me when they're struggling, like, great expectations. And it's like, yeah, the expectations kill you. And, it, and you, know, you got you hit it on the head. If you can fall in love with the process, if you can be totally about that, I think, you know, not just in, in your in your movie, but in any transition in life and anything, you know, that you're doing, if you, if you literally enjoy doing the day-to-day minutia, I think generally you're going to be okay. And that's that's something that's kind of helped me out um, moving past the, the playing days of just you know, trying to do something I enjoy, realizing you know that some money will follow with that and I'll be able to make a living. But just just kind of try to try to fall in love with something else because baseball was such a big part for so long. And you know, now, now it's not. For sure. Yeah, man, there's this – to sum up, there's this great – I can't remember where I saw it, but I, I write it down all the time. And, you know, I'll put it on like a whiteboard or whatever, but it's, it's like a mathematical equation. It's H, H equals R divided by E, and it's happiness equals reality divided by expectations. Oh, interesting. And it's so true. I yeah. mean, you, people say it all the time, like the key to happiness is low expectations. Yeah. It's, it's, maybe, it's maybe low expectations – isn't the way to say it because it has such a negative connotation, but realistic expectations. Like, I mean, there's so many things in my life that I could have appreciated more if I hadn't gone in thinking they were going to be the thing that made all the difference for the rest of my life. Just kind of going in low key and just taking it as it comes, man. Like I think, I think that's, that's the goal, man. But dude, I'm excited about this. Yeah. Thank um, you. I think, I think you're tapping into something that a lot of people are going to respond to, you know, even beyond uh, baseball players. Like everybody feels lost sometimes and that transition into uh, the next thing is, is hard. Yeah. So if, if you can, if we, you know, if you can help people either make that transition or, or, or deal with the one they're going through, like, man, how valuable is this? Yeah, no. And that's, that's ultimately the goal, you know, just, just give people an arrow sometime, give people a moral, not just a moral compass, but any kind of compass in a direction and, and that you hit it on earlier. Like when you feel like you have a goal and you're taking one step at a time towards that goal, there's a lot of, a lot of enjoyment in that. Um, when, you know, nobody wants to feel lost, obviously. So, you know, the, the hope is that, you know, we can provide some, some, a uh, little bit of assistance on that directional path. I think so, man. I'm excited, man. Well, thanks. Cool. Thanks yeah, for thanks for me, yeah, thanks for coming on, ZP. Appreciate yeah. it, man. Good times. Cool, man. All right. Cheers. Cheers.